All right, everybody, let's take a look at the text that we have here today, which is uh, Madonna uh, Klobenschlag's Cinderella the Legend. Now, this comes from a larger work called Kiss Sleeping Beauty Goodbye. Uh, so a couple things to note here at first, I think is important to notice here. Uh, first off, let's take a look at her name, Madonna. And if we also combine that with this, this Catholic Sisters of Humility, um, and that she has a PhD, all right, um, um, in, um, I'm sorry, not the clinical, not that one, uh, that she has written books on spirituality and feminism. All right, so these are some important clues that we have about who she is. Uh, first off, this name right here. Uh, this is another name, Madonna, would be another name for the Virgin Mary, which is a central female character in uh, a lot of Western traditions, especially Catholicism. And then the idea that she has written books on spirituality, she's part of the Catholic Sister Humility. So we do get a sense of that this is kind of her, her, her strong suit, her area, the thing that she focuses on, right? So we get a lot of those ideas to start with. Now, note right off the bat, okay, right off the bat here, we get two references to fairy tales. Uh, you guys might be familiar with them as the Disney versions, right? But we get right off the bat two versions of fairy tales, okay? And this idea that fairy tales depend upon archetypes. Right. We get the sense of 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 archetypes. In other words, Sleeping Beauty is a particular version or a particular type of story. She plays a particular role. Right. Uh, Cinderella plays a very particular role. So we keep coming back to those ideas. Cinderella, the best known and probably best liked fairy tale, is above all a success story. The rags to riches theme perhaps explains its equal popularity among boys as well as girls. It is a very old fairy tale having at least 345 documented variants and numerous unrecorded versions. The iconic focus of the tale is on the lost slipper and Cinderella's perfect fit, suggests that the story may have originated in the Orient, where the erotic significance of tiny feet has been a popular myth since ancient times. All right, so again, we have Cinderella here, okay, we have Cinderella. But I think it's important to note here that we have this idea of success story and then we have rags to riches, right? So what are we talking about here? So this is, uh, and we're going to kind of come back to these terms. Let me get that. We're going to see these terms again. These kind of come back to this idea of the American dream, right? Like this idea of being a success or that rags to riches, right? Like rags, you know, have, you know, poverty, right? Like you just have basic rags left to, that you're wearing, right? Like your clothes are all tattered and worn out, but that you get to riches, right? Like you go from nothing up to having plenty, right? So I think that those things are pretty important to note. So I'm going to put an exclamation point here because I think those are two really important places to have, right? Because that kind of comes back to this idea of the American dream. Now, I'm not going to say that, you know, these fairy tales aren't American. They're not particularly American, right? Like, we can't just say this is the American dream. But that plays into something that we, as a society, are very familiar with. All right. I notice here that there are 345 uh, versions that we know of of the Cinderella tale. One of my questions is, you know, I, question I would ask is, how are they different, right? When you look at that, how are they different from each other? Like, what makes them, you know, 345, there can only be so many variations, right? So I would love to know what some of those variations are, okay? All right, let's go to paragraph two then. Let's go to paragraph two. The basic motifs of the story are all well known. An ill-treated heroine who is forced to live by the hearth, 
the twig she plants on her mother's grave that blossoms into a magic tree, the task demand of a heroine, the magic animals that help her perform the task and perform her costume for the ball, the meeting at the ball, the heroine's flight from the ball, the lost slipper, the shoe test, the sister's mutilation of their feet, the discovery of the true bride and the happy marriage. The variants retain the basic motifs. While differing considerably in detail, they range more widely in their origins than any other fairy tale. Asiatic, Celtic, European, Middle Eastern, and American Indian versions numbered among them. So one of the words here that we are going to see is motif. We see that a couple times here. And this is going to be the kind of central repeated image. Right. So the central repeated idea or image, the thing that we keep coming back to that really controls and drives the narrative uh, inside of a text. So what are those motifs? What are those things that we see over and over and over? And then what do they represent? What do they represent? Uh, the, one of the examples I used was the idea of uh, in, in uh, Survivor. You get a t you get some sort of idol, like you get some sort of prize, you get some sort of physical object to show you have power, right? And we keep coming back to that. We keep mentioning that. We fight for it, right? Like it's the, that motif. It's that central idea. It's that image that we keep coming back to. Uh, also, another word in here. So I, I, I would put, if I were you, I would put like, you know, a question mark here if you didn't know what the word uh, motif was and then explain that. We also have heroin. And what we are here is this is the female hero right so this again comes back to that feminist view we come back to that idea of an archetype uh whereas you know when you think of hero the hero is always going to be a man right like the man saves it and even when there's a female hero she tends to be like the sidekick right or she's not as good as or she is in parallel to like this other male hero uh male hero right so the heroine this is the female character the female hero of the story the female lead of the story paragraph three the horatio alger's quality of the story helps to explain its special popularity in mercantile and capitalistic societies as a parable of social mobility it was seized upon by the writers of the new literature of aspiration in the 17th and 18th centuries as a basic plot for a new kind of private fantasy, the novel. Our literary world has not been the same since Pamela and all of her orphan governess sisters. Most Anglo-American novels, early and late, are written in the shadow of Pamela and the Cinderella myth. Even Franklin's autobiography, the seminal work in the success genre, owes much to the myth. The primary moral of the fairy tale, that good fortune can be merited, is very very, the very essence of the Protestant ethic. Lot to work with here. So let's first look at Horatio Algers. Okay, let's look at that. Let's look at this idea of a parable. And then let's also, uh, we're going to identify and talk about Franklin's autobiography and the Protestant ethic. All right. So let's take a look at some of these things. Now, again, these are probably questions that you have, right? As a parable, this is a moral tale. So a parable in, in, in religion, this is where we tell a story and the story is supposed to teach you a moral or a great lesson. Uh, you know, like you, the parable of the prodigal son, right? Like we, we talk about like all these biblical stories as parables, but we tell this story and the story imparts upon you some sort of morality. Horatio Algers was an author. He was a, a young adult author. Okay, uh, so he wrote books about and for young adults, and he basically, uh, uh, he wrote through the 1800s, right? He wrote through the 1800s. One of his central reoccurring themes is this idea of self-success, self-driven success, right? Self-driven success. So what that means then is that these characters, and they were usually young boys in his stories, and they were impoverished and they were poor, that they grew up and through their own hard work, their own determination, their own drive, 
they became part of the middle class. So they grew up a class, right? Now they didn't go from rags to riches necessarily from like impoverished to like super rich, but it's this idea that they grew up and that they became a part of this middle class or this important class of people, right? So I think that's, that's important to note uh, to start with. Also, too, we get to see that in Franklin's autobiography, this idea of, you know, again, the idea of the self-driven man. His autobiography talks about all the, the great things that he did, he accomplished, and let's be honest, he's on the $100 bill, so of course he did something great. But all of the things that he did were because of his hard work, his effort, his drive, uh, all the things that he wanted to do. Uh, uh, to make himself better. He took advantage of all the opportunities that were in front of him. Now, this idea of Protestant ethic, right? In particular, Protestant work ethic. So work equals goodness. Okay. Uh, I know that we talked about in, uh, we talked about in the crucible, we talked about in other kinds of these stories where the the thing, your success in the in the physical world was a reflection of the success that you would have in the afterlife, right? Like here on earth, if you were successful, that meant that you were a good person in your afterlife. If you had a bad physical life, you were going to have a bad uh, uh, moral life, right? And so these things were in parallel. So this idea that you worked hard to become successful, but that success was a reward for you being a good person, right? Morally, uh, religiously, ethically. At the personal and psychological level, Cinderella invokes intense identification. It's a tale of sibling rivalry and sublimity of sex role stereotyping, a moral fable about socialization. Very few themes could be closer to the inner experience of the child and emerging self enmeshing, uh, enmeshed in a family network. So what we have here then, again, when we talk about sex role stereotyping, that's the female role. That's what the thing that the woman should be doing, what we expect of her, right? The, perso the personality of the heroine is one that, above all, accepts abasement as a prelude to and precondition of affiliation. That abasement is characteristically expressed by Cinderella's servitude to menial tasks, work that diminishes her. This willing acceptance of a condition of worthlessness and her expect expectation of rescue as a reward for her virtuous offering is a recognizable paradigm of a traditional feminine socialization. Cinderella is deliberately and systematically excluded from meaningful achievements. Her stepmother assigns her to meaningless tasks. Her father fails her as a helpful mentor. Her sisters, inferior to quality of soul, are preferred before her. Lots to work with here. A lot of things to work with. So we have abasement as a vocabulary word. We have affiliation. Okay. So there's a couple of words that we're going to look at. We're also going to look at paradigm too. Okay. We're going to look at that. Let me get that. Okay. Uh, so it's not going to let me highlight that. So let me just go ahead and circle that. Okay. Um, and then this idea of the traditional feminine socialization. All right. So debasement means to be knocked down a class. Uh, if you look it up in the, the, the dictionary definition, you're going to see the word humiliation. All right. And so what we have then is that she was, because of her, uh, how she was treated in the family, she was knocked down a social class, right? Like she had to, she had to, you know, she was lower or less than other people, right? Affiliation is who you associate with or you belong with right this sense of belonging this sense of belonging let me write that where we can read it right so uh, if you are not down a class you are less than people. Well, then you are affiliated with or considered part of that group, right? And you can only be in that group because that's all you are worth, right? And then this paradigm, this is the model. 
This is what we expect. This is the norm, right? The standard. So when you think about like this idea of, uh, of what the standard traditional role of the female is, right? Like that is the paradigm. That is the what we expect you to be. Now, let's work back and forth for a minute. Okay, let's work back and forth. So we start with this idea of Horatio Algers and, and, and Benjamin Franklin and this idea of the Protestant work ethic. You work yourself up, right? Like you succeed, you move up through your hard work, through your hard efforts, you go up a class, right? But this in this fairy tale, we don't see that. We don't see that in this fairy tale. She is knocked down. She is expected to stay there. This is the model. This is the expectation. She is not to. Uh, she is not to advance. She is not to get better. We'll come back to this idea. We'll develop it in paragraph six here. Like most fairy tales, Cinderella dramatizes the passage to maturity. Her sojourn among the ashes is a period of grieving, a transition to a new self. On the explicit level of the story, Cinderella's literally grieving for her dead mother. Grimm's version of the tale preserved the sense of the process of growth that is symbolized in the narrative. Instead of a fairy tale godmother, deus ex machina, Cinderella sees a branch of hazel bush from her father. She plants the twig over her mother's grave and cultivates it with the prayers and tears. This is her contact with her past, her roots, and her essential self. Before one can be transformed, one must grieve for the lost as well as the possible selves, as yet unfulfilled, Kierkegaard's existential anguish. Okay, so what do we got there? So we have this idea of the sojourn or the journey, right? Like there is a journey. You have to go through a process, right? Okay, so let's go through. Okay. Now, in this story, we're going, to cut, we're going to use this word right here. Deus es machina, the, the machine of God. So Cinderella is in a really awful, horrible position, right? Like there's, she is so stuck and miserable and sad and everything happening to her is not okay. But then she has a fairy godmother and she solves everything for her, right? And then it all falls apart, but then she gets saved in the end. Deus is mocking the machine of God is that you get this miraculous, incredible solution to an impossible problem. Now we have a contrast here. Now we have a contrast. So in the idea of Horatio Algers and Benjamin Franklin, where you work yourself up, the Protestant work ethic, like you get better uh, through your own work, your own efforts, versus fairy tales where something miraculous happens. Like, bing, there you go. Everything's happy and wonderful and good. And the solution is right there, right? And now we have to square those because Cinderella, she gets out of that horrible situation, but not through her own hard work or through her own efforts. It is given to her, right? They end up in the same place. They end up that you know, having a great, happy, successful, whatever life, but it's not because of anything she did, okay? She didn't do it. She didn't earn it on her own. Uh, the parole version places great emphasis on midnight prohibition given to Cinderella. The traditional connotation would, of course, associate with the paternal mandate of obedience and a threat. If the heroine does not return to uh, domesticity or docility at regular intervals, she may lose her virtue and no longer merit her expected one. Like the old conduct manuals for ladies, the moral of the tale warns against feminine excursions as well as ambition. Too much of time spent abroad may result in indiscreet sex or unseemly hubris or both. Okay, so hubris here, pride, you think you're better than us, right? You think you're better than us, okay? And Peralt here, this is Charles Peralt. And he's a French author. And he is most identified with popularizing fairy tales. He made fairy tales popular, right? I'll leave that off there. He popularized fairy tales. He brought them to the mainstream. Fairy tales were always there, right? But they just weren't always brought up. 
So now if we take a look at what we have here, let's look at these contracts. Let's look at these contracts here, right? So again, I'm going to go back up to this idea of the Protestant ethic. You work hard, you lift yourself up, you do the thing, right? But in our previous version, right? In our previous version through Grimm, the brothers Grimm, that's uh, Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. They were, uh, they were German scholars. They studied folklore, okay? Which is the basis of, of, of fairy tales. It was the miraculous solution, right? That was the thing they focused on. But Peralt, in his version, he emphasized like the morality of the, or the parable part of this story. Like you must do these things so that you stay virtuous and good, right? Like you have to stay, you have to stay in the good graces to save your virtue, your innocence, right? Because if you don't, bad things are going to happen. You're going to fall prey or victim, or you're going to stray and you're going to be an unvirtuous or un, uh, unattractive, morally unattractive person. The slipper, the central icon, or the motif, is a symbol of sexual bondage and imprisonment in a stereotype. Historically, the virulence of its significance is borne out in the twisted horrors of Chinese foot binding practices. On another level, the slipper is a symbol of power, with all of its accompanies restrictions and demands for conformity. When the prince offers Cinderella the lost slipper, originally a gift from the magic bird or the fairy godmother or whoever gave that to him, he makes her his kingdom hers. So the slipper is a symbol of sexual bondage. And I don't mean like, you know, in, in, in some kind of uh, salacious way, but that you're stuck in the stereotype of a woman, right? Like women have to have small feet. They have big feet. That means they're less of a woman, right? Like, because that puts them on the same level as a man. The woman is supposed to be smaller than. The stereotype is that women are to be smaller than men. They are supposed to be subservient to men, right? Like men are to be bigger and stronger and faster and lord over the woman, right? And if she is as big as a man, that, that can't happen, right? That makes them physically equals. Uh, and so this idea of the slipper kind of binds her or attaches her or ties her to the uh, physical stereotypes of being a woman. And those physical types reflect what the social stereotype of the woman was. Again, remember in the story, uh, the slipper was very small, right? It was very small. If you remember like the Disney version, the other sisters, everyone who tried it on, their feet just couldn't fit in. Like they were just too big and they're squeezing and squeezing and it just wasn't going to go, right? In... Uh, uh, you get to see this idea that these women were uh, were not fit for what the prince had to offer because she was more on her, on his level physically, and by that meaning size. Last paragraph, number eight, or number nine. We know little of Cinderella's subsequent role. In Grimm's version, she's revenged by the birds who pluck out the eyes of the envious sister. But Peralt's version celebrates Cinderella's kindness and forgiveness. Her sisters come to live in the palace and marry two worthy lords. In the Norse variant of the tale, Aslog, the heroine, marries a Viking hero, buries several sons, and wields a good deal of power in Teutonic style. She is the daughter, uh, daughter of Sergeant and Brynhild. Uh, in most tales, Cinderella disappears into the vague regions known as the happily ever after. She changes her name, no doubt, and like so many women, is never heard of again. And I just want to come back to this part right here, right? And to play on that idea of the parable. We learned the story. We learned the story. The story was to be virtuous, to be to be innocent, to be clean, right? Or it was to, uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to earn your way up, right? Or whatever that parable or the moral of the story was, right? The rest of her life is meaningless. And again, that plays back to that stereotype of a woman, right? Like they serve a role. The woman serves a role for the family, for the man, for the society, right? And then this last line here, she changes her name, no doubt, and like so many other women is never heard of again. And it's not that she disappears, okay? It's not that she disappears, but it's that she, when she changes her name, she becomes somebody else, right? Right? Like she comes somebody else. She is no longer 
her person, her own person, with her own name, she is now Miss So and So, or she's attached to this person, or her worth is tied to that person, right? And, and so, as that, she has never heard of again. 